Mr. President. Senator from California. Mr. President, I want to thank my chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Corca, for his courtesies. Uh, we don't agree on this particular matter, uh, but there are a lot of matters when it comes to foreign policy we do agree on. And I do agree that this should be a very straightforward debate. Either you're for this agreement or you're not. And I think the fact that Congress is voting on it is good. I did support that in the committee. Um, that calls for regular order as far as the way we treat this uh, very important uh, vote. And I am very proud to stand here today as the longest serving member sitting on this Foreign Relations Committee today. Out of all the members, I've been there the longest. When I got there, I did not have these gray hairs. Um, I'm not blaming any of the topics that came before us for these gray hairs. However, we have had some tough debates, uh, and this certainly is, is one of them. So I know my friend has a lot to do, and I, I just want to say I was pleased to yield to him because I think he has set the right tone for this debate. Colleagues, this is a vote we're going to long remember, a vote on an arms control agreement that came about for only one reason. And that reason is our president and his team, Senator John Kerry, former Senator John Kerry, Secretary of State now, Wendy Sherman, the chief negotiator, that was part of the team, and many others worked tirelessly against the most vitriolic opposition. The president stood firm. And I want to say to him today, thank you, Mr. President. In that race for president that you won, you were very clear that you were going to reach out your hand and see if we could avoid another war in the Middle East. And I hope and pray that this Senate will give us and the world this opportunity. As the President has said, a military option is always on the table. It's in our Constitution that the President can respond to a threat. So nothing in this agreement takes a military response off the table. But it does say diplomacy should have a chance to work. And this diplomacy includes much of the world, Mr. President. And that's why it's so remarkable. I also want to give special thanks to two former secretaries of state, Colin Powell, a Republican, and Hillary Clinton, a Democrat, for weighing in on the side of diplomacy. Now, as senators, we deal with thousands of issues in the course of our careers. But we will long remember those long remember those that actually changed the course of history. Those kind of votes are votes of conscience, and they're votes about which we must look into our hearts, deeply into our hearts, and into our minds. And we have to look at the facts. The facts are stubborn things. No matter what 30-second ad there is, no, what, no matter what newspaper ad there is, there are facts that are obvious, and I want to go through those facts. I have them here on this chart. One, this agreement cuts off the uranium pathway to a bomb. It does it by reducing Iran's stockpile of enriched uranium by 98 percent and severely restricts its ability to enrich uranium. That's number one. Second, it cuts off plutonium pathway to a bomb. They do that by dismantling Iran's Iraq reactor core and replacing it with a core that cannot produce weapons-grade plutonium. That's the second part of the agreement. Three, it includes the most intrusive inspections regime ever negotiated. Let me repeat that. The deal includes the most intrusive inspections regime ever negotiated. This means 24-7 monitoring of Iran's declared sites, as well as inspections to the entire nuclear supply chain, from its uranium mines 
and mills to its conversion facility, to its centrifuge manufacturing and storage facilities. And this is critical. It provides the International Atomic Energy Agency, you will hear it referred to as the IAEA, with a mechanism to require that Iran grant access to its suspicious sites. No other international agreement has ever done this before. So when you hear colleagues say, well, Iran has 24 days you know, to hide things, all the experts will tell you, you could hide a computer, but you can't hide nuclear material. It has a half-life of thousands and thousands and thousands of years. But no other international agreement, not even the agreements we have with the IAEA, say that the IAEA has a deadline where access has to be granted to suspicious sites. Next, it requires the Iranians to disclose their past nuclear activities before they can receive any sanctions relief. Let me say that again. The Iranians have to disclose their past nuclear activities before they can receive any sanctions relief. And lastly, if Iran cheats, the United States and our allies will be able to snap back multilateral sanctions. There's a process there that gives us a lot of power to do that. Now, because of all of this, we think we'll keep this up here, Walker. Because of all of this, more than 100 nations support this deal, including many of our closest allies, like the United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, France, Japan, and Canada. 100 nations. And that is why 29 of the nation's top scientists, including six Nobel laureates, called the deal, and I quote, innovative and stringent, and even say it can serve as a, quote, guidepost for future agreements. 100 nations, 29 of our nation's top scientists. It is also why 60 bipartisan national security leaders supported, including leaders like Madeleine Albright, Thomas Pickering, Ryan Crocker. You know those names. You know those people. They have integrity, they have intelligence, they have experience. They were appointed by Republicans and Democrats alike. They point out that there are no viable alternatives to this agreement, and they are right. Now, anyone, and you're going to hear this from my Republican friends, anyone who says we should go back to the bargaining table, you're going to hear this over and over again, oh, just go back to the bargaining table, anyone who says that, after 20 months of negotiation and huge support in the world, is either engaging in fantasy or they truly want to sink this deal. So if you hear somebody say, oh, just go back to the table, just forget the support of the 100 nations, just go back, renegotiate this deal, let me tell you, they're either engaging in fantasy or they want to sink this deal. There is a hard, cold truth here. If we walk away, there will be no agreement. Let's be clear. And if that's your position, why don't you say it? But don't say, go back to the negotiating table, no problem. If we walk away, there will be no agreement. America will be isolating itself and undermining its role as a global leader on arms control. And that is why more than 100 former U.S. ambassadors say that without this deal, quote, the risks to the security of the U.S. and our friends and allies would be far greater. Let me say that again. 100 former U.S. ambassadors from both parties say, quote, the risks to the security of the United States and our friends and allies would be far greater than if we do the deal. We know right now that Iran has enough nuclear material to build 10 nuclear weapons. So who are you kidding when you say the world will be safer if this agreement falls and Iran is left to continue the dangerous course it began 
way back in 1984. We passed sanctions. We did it right here. I spoke on that. I said we got to keep our eye on Iran. We don't trust them. And so they came to the table. Opposing this agreement means walking away, walking away from the very strategy we embraced when we placed sanctions on Iran. And it means walking away from our best friends, our allies, and our trading partners. Now, when you probe the opponents of this deal and you say, well, if you go back to the table, uh, you're going to lose 100 nations, many of them our best friends, you know what they say? Oh, we can just sanction those friends. We can just sanction those allies. Uh, we can just sanction those trading partners. Can you imagine going after our best friends? Is that a winning strategy? That's another example of the opponents dreaming or scheming, dreaming of a successful go it alone strategy or scheming for another war in the Middle East. Those options, go it alone or a war, those are self-inflicted wounds we can ill afford. Let's put up the statement by Philip Hammond, the United Kingdom Foreign Secretary. This is what he says. And in a meeting with the various ambassadors of the countries who cut this deal, the same thing was said. But let's say it the way he did. This is the United Kingdom Foreign Secretary. Quote, if the United States were to walk away from this deal, international unity would disintegrate. The hardliners in Iran would be strengthened, and we would lose the most effective path to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, unquote. Philip Hammond, the UK Foreign Secretary. So, so again, look at what he's saying. He's saying if we walk away, the hardliners in Iran would be strengthened. They would win. So I ask opponents of this deal, why do you want to stand with the hardliners in Iran? Because you are standing with the hardliners in Iran who shout death to America, death to Israel. You are standing with them. They want to kill the deal. Now, I am under no illusions that this agreement solves all our problems with Iran. And I am under no illusions that this agreement will make Iran suddenly some positive player on the world stage that we can cozy up to. No, no. That is why this agreement is not based on trust. As Hillary Clinton said today, it's based on distrust and verification. She is right. This agreement is also based on the most stringent inspections regime ever, ever negotiated. Iran is a bad and a dangerous actor. I don't think there's any disagreement on that. That is why its non-nuclear activities will remain subjected to tough sanctions. But here's the question, the ultimate question that each of us must ask ourselves. Would we rather have a bad and dangerous actor with a nuclear bomb or a bad and dangerous actor without a nuclear bomb? My kids would say that's a no-brainer. The answer is obvious. We don't want Iran with a nuclear bomb, and that is why we need this deal. If Iran cheats, it will be in front of the whole world, and I will be among the first to consider any and all options. Now, I began by saying this is one of the most important votes we will ever cast in our lifetimes. I am reminded of another one, my vote against the Iraq War. It was lonely then. Only 23 of us. But you have to look at the situation. Some of the leading voices against this deal were the very same people who brought us the Iraq War. Remember Paul Wolfowitz saying the Iraqis would, quote, greet us as liberators? Remember Dick Cheney, 
who's out there now saying, vote no on this deal, oh, it's terrible. Remember what he said as he drew us into Iraq? There was, quote, he said, no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. And remember when he said the whole war would be, quote, weeks rather than months? I remember that after 10 years of war. Remember Bill Crystal saying we would, quote, be vindicated when we discover the weapons of mass destruction. And remember, some of our colleagues who are here today pushed hard for the Iraq War and said it would be great for America and great for Israel. Well, they were wrong then, and they are wrong now. Look, it's no secret that the prime minister of our great ally, Israel, is on the other side of this argument. But we must also remember that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was a cheerleader for the Iraq War, and he said in 2002, quote, if you take out Saddam's regime, I guarantee you that it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region, unquote. Prime Minister Netanyahu argued for the Iraq War saying, quote, I guarantee you it will have enormous positive reverberations on the region. Positive reverberations, instead devastating consequences. More than 4,000 of our brave American men and women killed, 32,000 wounded. And we know, we know that a lot of the Ba'athists joined ISIS. And the Ba'athists were loyal to Saddam. Now they're guiding ISIS. No positive reverberations there. Devastating consequences. And if we're completely honest, and we really ask the question, who won the war in Iraq? The answer comes back, Iran. Iran. They have never had more influence in modern times on Iraq than they have today. That is why, as a stalwart supporter of Israel and the Israeli-American relationship, I strongly support this deal. I am the proud author of the last two U.S.-Israel security bills passed by Congress. They were called the U.S.-Israel Enhanced Security Cooperation Act of 2012 and the U.S.-Israel Strategic Partnership Act of 2014. And I believe, as the author of those two bills, that President Obama signed, I believe this deal makes the United States safer, and it makes Israel safer, and it makes the entire world safer. I said that Prime Minister Netanyahu is very clearly opposed but let's look at some of the top military experts in Israel, experts who understand what is paramount to Israel's security. Let's look at Ami Ayalan. He's a former head of Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service. This is what he says. When it comes to Iran's nuclear capability, this deal is the best option. Now, this isn't just some citizen in the street. This is the former head of Shin Bet, Israeli's internal security service, saying this. Then there's Amram Mitzna, a retired major general in the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, former member of the Knesset, former mayor of Haifa. This is what he said. Quote, for Israel's sake and for all of the people in the Middle East, we must not miss this opportunity, unquote. And then there's Ephraim Halevi, former director of the Mossad. He said, quote, without an agreement, Iran will be free to act as it wishes, unquote. Let me repeat that. This is the former director of the Mossad. He said, without an agreement, Iran will be free to act as it wishes, these leaders that I've quoted from Israel are some of the most knowledgeable in the world when it comes to Israel's security. And they believe this deal will make Israel safer. It doesn't change the fact 
that the Israeli government opposes this. I agree with that. I understand that. But there is a split in Israel, and it is worth commenting on it. With their expertise and their knowledge, these endorsements by these Israelis should be taken seriously. And also, the endorsements from our current and former colleagues in Congress should be taken seriously. 11 Jewish former members have weighed in, saying, quote, we champion the U.S.-Israel alliance, and we all strongly support this agreement because it will enhance the security of the United States, the state of Israel, and the entire world. I thank them for weighing in. This is one of those debates. It's very hard, regardless of your position, because it's emotional, it's difficult, and yet they weighed in as did the Israeli security experts. Believe me, the pressure on them not to talk was enormous. This deal also has the support of some of the most knowledgeable and respected foreign policy lawmakers who ever served in Congress. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to insert in the record two opinion pieces, one written by Senators Carl Levin and John Warner, and another by Senators Sam Nunn and Richard Lugar. Without objection. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Two Democrats, two Republicans, leaders all, respected, effective. These former colleagues understand the risks of military action, and they're right. And they know this deal doesn't rule out the use of military force. The United States can strike if we need to. But we must first try diplomacy. Since when are we afraid of that? We can try diplomacy because we're the most powerful nation on Earth. We should try diplomacy. And if it fails, we always have all options on the table, as our president has said, as I have said, as everyone has said. You know, it, it's striking to me that we don't have one Republican for this. I, I'm kind of amazed. All the focus was on the Democrats, really, and a few are opposing, and vast majority are for it. I'm just surprised that a Richard Lugar couldn't sway anybody, that a Colin Powell couldn't sway anybody, that a John Warner couldn't sway anybody. And also, the religious communities across the United States apparently aren't swaying anybody. It is telling that 340 U.S. rabbis fear that if the United States rejects the deal, and I quote, the outcome will be the collapse of the international sanctions regime, an Iranian race for nuclear weapons, and isolation of Israel and the United States from international partners. 340 rabbis. There's also support from more than 53 Christian leaders and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops who referred to Pope Francis's hope for a deal that he says is a definitive step toward a more secure and fraternal world. I don't know why we haven't been able to really see bipartisan support in the Senate. It's, I'm puzzled by it. I'm saddened by it. It appears to me this is political. President Obama wants it. He worked hard for it. They don't like it. I, that's what I think. And I, I may be wrong. But it just, it's hard for me to imagine, with all these solid Republicans in favor of this deal outside of the Senate and the House, we just can't seem to have bipartisanship. These faith leaders, they're speaking on behalf of their synagogues, on behalf of their congregations, and they're faithful. They're speaking for so many Americans, so many Americans who have prayed on this issue and have come to the conclusion that this is the best deal for our nation. Believe me, it's easier to say no. You can always say, well, I don't like line four, page two. A deal by its very nature is not perfect. It's not. That's why it's a deal. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a fiat. Oh, I want this. Okay. 
We make deals. We do it here all the time. But somehow this deal, because it isn't perfect and everyone agrees it isn't perfect, somehow we, we can't seem to get bipartisanship. And it breaks my heart, frankly. Colleagues, this is really a major moment for us as individuals and for our nation. We will be judged on this vote, and we should be judged on this vote. We should be judged on votes that could lead to another war in the Middle East. At least one of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle admitted his truthful position. I respect that. He said, quote, we can, quote, set Iran's nuclear facilities back to day zero using military force. He's voting no on this agreement. And anyone else who joins him should know this. To walk away means Iran can continue its nuclear program at will. This is not acceptable. And it means a path to war. Let us not tiptoe around this. This option, the option to no agreement, isn't go back to the bargaining table because everyone has said very clearly, all our allies, they're not going back to the bargaining table. So we have no agreement. And to walk away means the international sanctions collapse. And if we think that our, we ourselves can now turn to our best friends and allies, like the United Kingdom, and say, well, if you don't go along with us, uh, we're not trading with you anymore, that's just not going to happen. So to walk away means Iran will continue its nuclear program because there won't be a deal. To walk away means we will find ourselves isolated from some of our best allies in the world. Remember, 100 nations support this deal, 100 nations, including the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Australia, Japan, and Canada. To walk away, I believe, means war. And the other side will say, oh, that's just a scare tactic. It's not a scare tactic. If you can't go back to the negotiating table, because nobody's going back there with you, you can go back. You'll be there by yourself. Iran walks away. They continue their program. And we're not going to stand for that. We've all said that. So to walk away, in my view, means war. Because when we walk away, there is no deal. Iran keeps its nuclear program, and that cannot be allowed to happen. You know, another one of our colleagues that we serve with, and I have a lot of respect for and a good friendship with, once said, bomb, 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 bomb Iran. You remember that. He, he's going to vote no on this deal. And, and that's going to move us more toward his reality. Wars are easy to start, and they're hard to end. Wars are a stain on the human race. And we should do everything in our power to avoid war. Now, avoiding war does not mean giving up strength, because again, a military response to Iran is always on the table. And if Iran violates the deal, the whole world will know it. It will be right out there, and the whole world will stand with us in taking action. Diplomacy is the first resort. War is the last resort. I have voted for war, OK? I said, let's go after bin Laden. I voted for that war. Easy to start, hard to end. So my colleagues, I'll say it again. This is our chance, and this is our choice. History will judge us. With this one vote, we have the chance to seize a historic opportunity to once again make America a shining example of leadership. And with this vote, we have a chance, a, a real chance, to make this world safer right now for our children and our grandchildren. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I would yield the floor.